your TFM 10% system is as good as anything. But one day is Thursday, August 31st, 2023. This is the week. Yeah, charts. I'm just want to thank all you guys and gals for being here tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. Hang on to those till we get the live charts. By the way, if you want to watch these shows live, DaveLander.com slash webinar. So I want to do a brief follow-up on something we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. And it's kind of like a new tool or maybe a, a new spin or an old tool, so to speak. And then I got to ask the question today about discretion with a mechanical system uh, by one of you guys in Facebook, by how. And I want to flesh that out a little bit and talk about systems. This is flame screen. As you know, you can lose money trading oil. So often sum it up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's from my buddy Greg Morris. Okay. So last week and the week before, we were talking about what Jeff had said. He said, if you're using a weekly, if you use weekly charts, a 5% buy line is not much different from the 10% buy line as far as the entry and exit points. And we are now at the 5% weekly line. And he went on to say that it could be a bit of a warning shot. And the more I noodled with that, the more I liked it. And that's one reason why I love having an educational business. And on top of that, it's one reason why I love having the Facebook group. So you and I, you, so you guys, and I could discuss these type of things and we can noodle with them and check them out. And then uh, I know like John does a lot of uh, IPO research and there's uh, other people that are into the market timing and different things and we all kind of collaborate. And I think that's just really a cool thing. I know I'm a big bit of a nerd, but anyway, if you take the 50 week closing high, and what I did here in green was I set this to 100% of the 50 week closing high. And I went ahead and used an area chart, something I found by accident. And then I went in and put in the 95% or 5% less than the 50 week closing high. And that's right here. And then the normal line that we use for the TFM 10% system is 10%. So Jeff's point was once you get more than 5% away, the market could be in trouble so as long as you're within five percent the market's in good shape when you get more than five percent away the market could be in trouble and then ten percent as i've been saying is where bad things tend to happen when you get ten percent or more or below baleo and guyard talked about the 200 moving average i know i talk about this every week but you can put pretty much use any performance based metric and when that is exceeded on a daily chart or a weekly chart that's where bad things tend to happen so sometimes you go from bad to worse in markets and as i said before and i learned this from greg morris as long as you're fairly close to the old highs as a general statement now don't don't go bet the farm on this but as a general statement the market tends to do okay you don't get a bear market directly off an all-time high it, it it just doesn't implode right away it feels like that but that just just doesn't happen like i said last week and week before and many other weeks before you have time to get out before bear market but not unlimited time so just in case you're wondering where we are i think the market weakened a little bit after i took the snapshot but we're not too far away from where this number was 45 12 97 so 45 13 round numbers on the s p and kind of helps you to see the forest for the trees and it seemed kind of scary a couple of weeks ago and i'm not sure we're out of the woods just yet it's it's what's kind of cool is um you know it's like it, the the market is is at this kind of inflection point and what happens is when you have a big rally with on a daily especially and you're getting closer to those old highs it feels pretty good but as soon as it weakens a little bit, it gets a little scary. So sometimes it helps to look at the weekly chart, especially with this 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 new twist on an old indicator, to let you know where you are, to help you see the forest for the trees, as I've been explaining. George says, nice looking pullback. Yeah, a good point. That is kind of a cool looking looking pullback. And, you know, maybe that's a system in and of itself is look for pullbacks to that five percent line in the S&P 500, and maybe that could be a system in and of itself. 
Okay, so Hal asked earlier today, do you have, do you also use discretion with the TFM 10% system? Have you also looked at the historical signals and played out how you would have applied discretion to the signal if it would have been the right slash wrong decision? Well, obviously I look at every signal historically because I like to hand test systems. In fact, I don't even program systems anymore like I used to. Many years ago, I used to wake up early and just program for hours and hours and hours. But I don't do that anymore. And every now and then I get an idea and I'll just hand test it and see what it looks like. Anyway, let's let's just talk about the system a little bit and then we'll I'll give you some thoughts on systems design and this system and then we'll kind of pick apart his his question or we'll answer it based on some random thoughts. Well, first of all, a cell signal is a close below the 10% line and a close below the 50 week simple moving average. So that would be a cell signal there. As you can see, both of those things happen, okay? Now, this was a screen capture that John grabbed from last week or the week before, and he pointed out some points where there was discretion. So one thing that, that is not in this chart, because we were just talking about the performance-based metric without the 50-day or 50-week, in this case, simple moving average. So you would need the simple moving average, although the two, the two he pointed out here would actually still be sell signals because they were both below the 50-week moving average. This point here, where it says discretion. Now remember, we're not buying when when with when we are within 10% of the 50-week high. We're buying when we have two bars of Landry light above the 50-week moving average, and we are within 10% of the 50-week closing high. And that'll make a little bit more sense in just one second. So yeah, we buy in the green or the pink, okay? But we also have to have two bars of Landry light, and that's my whipsaw filter. And I'll touch upon that in one second. So a couple of random thoughts before I get into answering the question more directly is one thing is very important when it comes to a system, any system, okay? You need to understand the designer's intent. And as I've said a thousand times before, early on, I was hired to help someone pick stocks. And I pro did a lot of the programming too. And I would, sh I would just, I thought my job was going to be to run the scans and then say, well, here's your stocks. And that's all I did. Well, I quickly found out that he wanted me to do a little bit more. He wanted me to, to analyze the setups before giving them to him, or certainly don't give him any setups that are, that are not really good setups. And, and on the first setup that I gave him, I remember very distinctly, I said, okay, well, here's a setup, thinking I just give him the setups and I was done. And he says, well, that's not a setup. And we went back and forth a little bit. And finally, I just walked him through it and showed him the programming. And it, yes, it works. And this is your setup. This is what you said. He goes, well, I don't like it. So that was my first kind of wake up call early on in my career that just because somebody designs a system or has a setup or something, and especially if they're a discretionary trader, doesn't mean that just because the rules fit, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a good setup. And that's kind of the, the secret to trading a little bit longer term is to go in and study what makes the best setups. Now, with a mechanical system, in this particular case, I just wanted to write a super simple system that would help get you out the way before a diaper change moment, so to speak. And going into the system, I was thinking, okay, if a market drops 10% or more, it's probably in trouble from its 50 week moving average, 50 week closing high, excuse me, 50 week closing high. It's probably in trouble. And throughout history, 10% is a good round number, and bad things tend to happen after that. And sometimes the market loses half its value. And if it's going to lose half its value, or 80% of its value, or 90% of its value, like it did back in the Depression, or 76% of its value, like the NASDAQ did, I always forget how big a NASDAQ slide was. But people don't talk about that often. That NASDAQ slide in 2000 was in the mid 70%, if I remember. I know it lost half its value, then it lost half its value again. And I've seen people before in presentations. I'm getting a little sidetracked here, but that's just me. <laughs> but I've seen people before in presentations say, well, when a market drops 50%, go in and sell puts. And I'm like, okay, well, that'll work until it don't. 
And then the other problem with that type of thing is you don't have a representative sample. So that's happened, what, uh, I don't know, 15 times over the last 2,000, uh, 100 and something years. You don't really know what could still happen to you. It just looked no further than 2,000 with the NASDAQ again, lost half its value, then it lost half its value again. Now, so again, I just wanted something to kind of let me know when the market could be in trouble. Mechanical systems alert you to performance-based metrics. Now, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, bowtie moving average, proper water, Landry light, and of course, the TFM 10% system. These are mechanical things, not that we trade them fully mechanically or use them fully mechanically, but they are tools to help help us stay on the right side of the market. So mechanical systems alert you to performance-based metrics, either good or bad, without any judgment. So they're 100% objective. Sometimes you might be bullish or bearish for whatever reasons, valid or not, price-based or not. And if you have some sort of metrics out there, some performance-based metrics, it might kind of tap the brakes on your bullishness or bearishness and, and help you see what's really happening and the beauty of something mechanical not that you want to follow it mechanically but the beauty of something mechanical is it gives you a 100 percent objective way of looking at things and then you could use that to help build your discretionary case now you have to be careful not to curve fit when designing a new system or researching an old one. So how is pointing out, well, what discretion would you have used? That kind of reminds me of sometimes you build the system and then you go back in and you're like, oh, well, it had this big crash here. Uh, maybe let's figure out a way to not take that signal because it would have failed miserably or something. And then you put it in a whipsaw filter possibly for that. And if you if you're not careful, you can end up curve fitting the system perfectly to what happened historically. So you've got to be really careful with these whipsaw filters. The 50 simple, obviously, on a weekly basis is our moving average whipsaw filter with Landry light. And I'll show you the buys in just one second. So do consider some whipsaw filters, but don't go overboard. So Hal was pointing out buying just when you're within that 10%, that might work longer term. My initial testing on that was you get a lot of whipsaw because the market can can improve and then go back to being ugly again. Now, along those lines, you want to keep your systems super simple. I've received emails from people who have been trading a lot longer than I have, and I respect because they do a lot of market timing and that type of research and they pull their funds out of the market when things get iffy. And in one particular case, this gentleman said, your T TFM 10% system is as good as anything. So that made me feel really good hearing that your TFM 10% system is as good as anything. And it's just a really, really simple system. Now, here's the thing. As I often preach, all representative systems are going to look the same. I, I, I'd like to think I have something better than, than other people, and in some cases, maybe I do. But any type of system that I have, if you boil it down, which you could boil down any system, believe me, and it's going to have the, the common nuances. So, for instance, as I've said at nauseam, I think it was on May 3rd, I got an email saying I'm going to go try some other guy. And I'm like, that's fine. But if that other guy is a trend follower, He's going to look like a genius because you you waded through all this slop with me, all this chop, and you hung in there, and now we're due. And little did I know that the next day we'd start getting some decent setups and some existing setups begin to take off. And luckily, it was me that looked like a genius because things begin to take off. Well, I was just due. It was nothing magical I did. I just do what I always do. And again, systems, representative systems are going to look alike. John, I'll get to that in just one second. Thanks for the question. Now, trying to figure out how you would have used discretion sort of defeats the purpose of the system. However, kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth just a little, 
seeing systems in action does provide you with a real with a real life stress test because the map is not the territory. So I, I had a signal on weakness that I, first of all, I didn't notice, but then if I would have noticed it, I wouldn't have taken it anyway. And I'll show you that in just one second. Now, I don't follow any system mechanically, although I did take the last TFM 10% system for S and Gs, the, the buy signal in the queues, and we'll get to that. Now, here's one of the problems with applying discretion to something that's mechanical and has like a mechanical edge, okay? So if you go back to 1987, as we were discussing earlier on Facebook, the signal triggered on, triggered on a Friday, and then on Monday, the stock market imploded. So if you were following a mechanical system, I know we're talking a lot of hypotheticals here, then you would have had to heed that warning when that signal triggered right before the crash. And there's no guarantees in trading, and this is a free system, so you can't, so you can get your money back if it doesn't work right. <laughs> there's no money to get back, is what I'm saying. But no guarantees of trading, but this simple little system would have gotten you out before every major bear market in history. Now you would have gotten whipsawed a few times, but quoting Greg Morris, as I say ad nauseum, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. So anyway, the buy signal has the whipsaw filter in it where it has to close above the 10% line and have two lows greater, in other words, the Landry light, than the 50-week simple moving average. So here was a buy right here. It's kind of hard to see because of the moving average thickness, and we'll get to that in one second. So I did not notice this signal because of that thickness of the line. I like a nice, big, thick moving average so I could see it. However, I never like to buy on weakness. So yes, I would have likely used discretion here if I was following the system because you are above the 10% line, which would be right here, the red zone, okay? And you did have two bars of Landry light, but notice that the market closed the week fairly poorly. And that was a pretty big slide in here. So what I would do, and I didn't go in and I did some back testing after I, I discovered this in real time. And in real time is a great stress test for systems because you're going to see how you are going to perform and how the system is going to perform in real time. And one thing you have to be careful of is with a mechanical system, your drawdowns are always ahead of you. Your biggest drawdowns are always ahead of you. And people make the mistake, present company included, of thinking that, oh, this thing, the worst drawdown ever was 10% or whatever. So I'll never have to worry about it drawing down more than 10%. I had a 4X system years ago and I was trading it for a friend and he gave me $5,000 to trade with it because the drawdown was like $5,000 or something. And in perfect hindsight, it was a big mistake. We did double the money and I think he ended up pulling the money out because he needed it. It was it, that that should have been a sign right there. Putting up five thousand is probably not enough money to be trading with. But anyway, lesson learned there. I could have just as easily blown up that five thousand dollars because I didn't recognize at that point in time your biggest drawdown was ahead of you. But shortly thereafter, I did tell a system designer that, and he got absolutely mad at me. And I'm thinking like, geez, this guy's in for a rude awakening. But that's another story altogether. So there was the last buy in the piece around 41.25, maybe a little bit higher than that round number, maybe 41.50, and so forth, so good on that signal. Now, John says, does the 25 MA versus the 5% line tell us anything similar to 50 NA versus 10%? Hmm. I did mess around with different moving averages. Um, I would think an exponential moving average might be a little too quick to catch up to price uh, in this particular case, because we're looking for a longer term trend following system. So if we have time and we get the live charts, maybe we can pull that up and noodle with it a little bit. But a uh, good point. 
So the last signal in the queue is bar one, bar two, meaning two bars above the, or the point I'm trying to make is two bars above the 50-day simple moving average. I keep saying day. This is the 50-week simple moving average. The reason I say day is when you change your time periods, obviously, a moving average, if you look at that 50 days, it goes to 50 weeks when you change to weekly. Now, some people, which is pretty smart, if they want to see what a longer-term weekly moving average looks like on a chart, they could just plot like a longer-term moving average on the chart, which would be the equivalent to the weekly moving average. So the 50-week moving average would be 250 days on a daily, okay? So if you wanted to have that, this line in the background on a chart, so you know what the weekly moving average is, you could plot, certainly plot that, or you could just flip to the weekly chart. But some people find that useful, like let's say using a five-minute chart and you want to see where the hourly moving averages or the 30 minute moving averages, or you just use a longer term moving average on that time frame and divide by the, the amount of periods that you want to jump up. In this case, we're going for a weekly, so it'd be five. So it'd be five times 50, which would be 250. So hopefully that made sense. If it made sense to you, you already knew it. <laughs> so it's one of those things. So anyway, there was the buy signal there. I did buy a hundred shares, kind of for S and Gs. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna follow the system mechanically and see what's, what happens. And so forth, so good. There's the buy down there, 100 shares, 319.49. I bought a little bit before the close, so I was able to beat the system, so to speak, by about 50 cents. But technically, I, I sh probably should have waited for the close. Now, the current sell on this is way down there at 314.28, and we're way up here at 378 and change, at least we were when I took that snapshot. So right now, snapshot, I think we've slid a little bit since then, but when I took the snapshot, we were at 378.43. There's my entry of 319.49. So it's $58.74 in profit. We multiply that by 100, and that's $5,894 in profit. Not too shabby, so far so good. Now here's the rub. If you're following this system mechanically, and Remember, I didn't build any money management into this system. And, and with this last signal, I'm like, well, I'm going to take this for S and Gs and see what happens and show you how following the system mechanically would work. But it's going to be pretty hard for me to give up almost $6,000 in profit. So if we go from where we are now down to the sell, you would lose from the from the original signal that would be a loss of 521 not a huge loss but a loss nonetheless but if you look at where we are $5,894 down down to minus 521 i doubt very seriously i'll be able to hold all the way down to that level but we'll see you know maybe if we get back at the 5% zone i might think about bailing out and maybe I need to buy Jeff a beer if that happens and then this thing implodes all the way down to the regular sell. But anyway, that's a $6,415 equity swing. And that's that's nothing to sneeze at. That's pretty significant. And from an ego standpoint, it's gonna be pretty hard for me to give up $6,000 or what is it, 50, 60 points in open profits. Let's take a look at your question. Okay, so stick it under the swing lows. Okay, George is saying, yeah, you you know, it's it's you kind of read my mind. You're pretty smart there, George. I'm impressed. While I was talking, I was kind of thinking, okay, if we drop down below this 5% line, maybe below this low with a little bit of wiggle room might be my exit. Because I don't wanna I don't wanna give up profits all the way down to here. Okay, I'll still get 40 or 50 points or so. Now the good news is, but it, but remember this is a weekly chart, so it's gonna take a while. The good news is the 50 simple, 50 week simple moving average is starting to catch up. It's got a pretty good slope. Looks like the slope round numbers, if we stay fairly high in here and drop off some low numbers, is going to be five points a week. So if I can hang on for about five weeks, that moving average is gonna be 50 points 
closer or 25 points closer, I guess. If I could hang on for 10 weeks, it'll be 50 points closer to the price. And then I could live with, okay? I'm okay with a with a drawdown open profits. I just don't want to see open profits that large turn into a loss. In hindsight, I should have bought 200 shares and flipped out 100 of those shares when I'm up 20 or 40 points or whatever, and then close my eyes on a remainder and let it all play out. So John's saying, what about a 25-day moving average? And I guess we'll leave the 50 in. So let's add in a 25-day simple moving average. Okay, 20, and then we'll make it, uh, what color is going to show up? Let's make it green, and then let's make it nice and thick. Okay, so John's point is, if we're talking about markets that could be in trouble, why not look at the 25-day moving average, okay, half the periods, because we're using half the periods for this caution zone, the 5% zone, okay? And by the way, as I showed earlier, you can see all these parameters over here if you have a CP. My plugin is free. I can't help you with the price of, of uh, ACP, but I do give my plugin away, at least for now. I always say that every week. Okay, so John says, what about a danger zone when you're below the 25 and you are in that caution zone? So yeah, right there would be caution. That would have been a pretty good signal, okay? So there's some, there's some merit there. Let's go back in time and see. Now here would have been a whipsaw, okay? And this is where I don't wanna talk in hindsight too much, okay? But you might say, well, okay, we had this whipsaw, we closed the week a little bit off the lows, let's see if we take out this pivot low, kind of like what George was talking about before we seriously think about getting out of the market. And then if you go over here and squint your eyes, you can see there was an actual no, we weren't below 5%. Uh, so here's here's something kind of cool. I know I'm a nerd. You want to party with me, right? We closed below the moving average, but we didn't close into that caution zone. Obviously, the, here's something interesting. The pandemic, if you look on a closing basis, a 5% sell signal with a 25 simple moving average weekly would have given you the same exact signal because we slid so hard when the market finally took that pandemic seriously. Right here looks like would have been a little bit of a whipsaw. So you will get a lot of whipsaw by decreasing your parameters, but it might keep you out of trouble or alert you that you might want to pay attention and maybe pull your horns in a little bit. So look right here, what John's saying is, is more than 5% away below that 25 simple, okay? And that turned out to be a pretty ugly slide. I mean, we went from, uh, that's about 500 points in the S&P or 400 points at least. That's pretty significant. So you might be onto something there. There would be some whipsaw, obviously, and probably probably too much whipsaw to follow it mechanically at first glance because like right here, you'd have a sell, although it didn't take out the pivot low. And, you know, over here, you'd have, possibly some whipsaw yeah you have a little whipsaw in here but even those whipsaw periods you might actually want to be out of the market now where are we 2008 i just rewatched the big shard that was that was very enjoyable it took me about two weeks <laughs> 10 minutes at a time every time i go in for lunch but anyway the big short was based on what happened in 2008 2009 but you can see, let's see where your first signal would have been. Your first signal would have been right here. And like Jeff says, well, maybe that's a shot across the bow. I don't want to, I don't want to sell the form, but maybe I want to get it appraised. So again, the point, not to beat the dead horse, but the point is you would get some whipsaw, like right there would have been whipsaw. Okay. But it wouldn't hurt to get cautious when you do get one of those. Signals. Let's just check out this last uh, one more bear market, and then we'll move on. So your warning shot across the bow 
Well, you would have had a TFM 10% system probably right there, I think. And then that would have been a whipsaw filter, whipsaw signal, but notice that we did eventually top out and you did have quite a few 5% signals in here. Even though they had a little whipsaw, it would have possibly alerted you to the fact that the market's in trouble. Now, as I said, ad nauseum, I do remember, actually that was 2007, where I think that signal was a little bit better. But I do remember apologizing to my clients somewhere in here, or was it late in fall? It was maybe late, yeah, I seem to remember October. Yeah, the market was making all-time highs, I couldn't find a setup on the long side to save my life. All I could find was shorts. I recommended a few shorts and then I recommended a few more and then we just kept finding shorts. And I apologized to my clients. I said, guys, I know the market is right at or near all time highs, but I can't find any long side setups to save my life. So we started putting on shorts little by little and then the, the rest is history. I don't know if that's always gonna work out like that, but as I preach, it pays to pay attention to the database. So where I'm going with this is, even though if the market's healthy, there are other things that you can do, such as looking at 2000 stocks every day, paying attention to your database, seeing where your setups are stacking up to help you make that determination. So use something mechanical like this to help you out, but then take a look at the big picture. And then again, not to beat the dead horse, but use something mechanical like this to kind of wake you up to the fact that maybe the tide may be turning, okay? So John, I don't know if that um, is what you're seeing or thinking with that, but that's um, something we point out. Okay, let's hop into crypto. We actually have a crypto, okay. When was the last time the database was bullish? This summer, George, pay attention. <laughs> when we started buying stuff, yeah, see, I want to party with John. She says, yes, yeah, fun to think about. It's fun to think about moving averages. <laughs> well, if you ever come to town, we can go get a couple of beers and talk about moving averages. We don't have to talk about moving averages, but we probably will. All right, let's shift gears and get into crypto. Frenchie wants to know about Ripple. Before we take a look at that, let's just take a look at Bitcoin real quick, see where we are, see what we can gleam. Oh, by the way, let's let's do this for S and Gs. Now it's gonna be really noisy. I was playing with this earlier. I know you want to party with me. Let's take a look at Bitcoin with the TFM. And you can see the parameters are, are minuscule because this is such a volatile market. So these parameters would have to probably be much, much, much bigger. Although it is kind of cool, you can see when the market's doing really well it rarely corrects more than 10%. So maybe you want to write that down and that would be kind of an interesting thing to look at. So let's see, this is a weekly. Let's uh let's get to a, let's go back to a daily chart, take a look at Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is 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 a bit of a bummer. A couple of days ago, I was pretty encouraged. Grayscale won their lawsuit the GBTC went up three points, but unfortunately it's retracing quite a bit of that. So that's a bit of a bummer. I've always said if the ETF gets approved, it's gonna take off, but the market doesn't always do what it should, obviously, or what is logical. So it looks like it was buy on the rumor and sell on the news in that particular case. By the way, as, I was going live tonight. I was thinking the 30 EMA with Landry Light is probably your best friend in crypto. So let's let's take a look at that just real quick and then we'll take a look at Ripple and a couple others. So we take a look at the 30 EMA and there it is with Bitcoin. And here's a simple little rule. Don't even think about buying Bitcoin or any other crypto for that matter if you are below the 30 EMA. Now, there might be cases where there might be an exception here and there if the market is really blasting higher. But yeah, even back here, you shouldn't have bought until it at least crossed back over that 30 EMA. So 30 EMA could be your best friend in crypto. Let's take a look at Ethereum real quick. 
and then we'll take a look at Ethereum versus Bitcoin. So Ethereum just looking kind of ugly in here. It never did get above the, not even briefly, the 30 EMA. So again, avoid anything that is below the 30 EMA in crypto. And that alone is going gonna, is gonna to save you a lot of weeping and gnashing of the teeth, believe me. If we could just find like this Juno, whatever the hell that is, okay? Don't buy it if it's below the 30 EMA, okay? It was a buck 40. Where is it now? 14 cents. You are welcome. <laughs> you know, we could do this all night, but you kind of get the idea. Don't buy any crypto pair or even the stocks for that matter as a general statement. That might be an exception here and there in a deep pullback. But as a general statement, especially if you're new or newer to trading, that one little rule is going to save you a lot of angst, believe me. Okay, so Frenchie wants to look at Ripple. XRP, USD. Oh, we need to look at um, the Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum too, real quick. Yeah, that's ugly, Frenchie. Um, you know, I kind of set it up. I kind of set you up, I guess, by saying it, I, I haven't looked at Ripple in a while. But you can see that it's well below the 30 EMA. It's just looking ugly to here. So I would not, uh, I would not buy that. It's it's in nearly impossible to short crypto now. I used to be able to short it, but the uh, the government cracked down on offshore exchanges, unfortunately. And I don't know why, but you know, as long as you pay your taxes, I don't know why the government's got to be that way. Maybe it's because they're worried they can't get the tax money. But that's another conversation altogether. Maybe John and I talk about that when we have a couple of beers. Okay, so that is um, no bueno. There's a theory. No, it's Ethereum Classic, ETH, BTC. All right, let's take a look at Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Just real quick. So Ethereum, uh, to my surprise, has actually improved versus Bitcoin. It's been a lot weaker than Bitcoin for a long, long time, but now it's getting a little bit stronger. As you can see, the Ethereum versus Bitcoin is back above the 30 EMA. All right, any more crypto before we hop into stocks? All right, let's get into stocks. All right, that's in P500. Now, one thing I was telling my peeps tonight, my clients, is when a market is kind of at an inflection point, it begins to sell off, then begins to rally back, it could change drastically over a couple of days. So a couple of days ago, we had that big up day. That's certainly improving, not out the woods yet. We had yesterday, did okay. Today, we're beginning to lose a little steam, and you hate to see this thing stall out in its retrace rally. I hate to say it, but you do have a possible head and shoulder tops top in the works and now that right side is higher than the left and i found on found out early on just by looking at a, a shit ton of charts that those are more bearish than just a generic head and shoulders now i don't trade directly up head and shoulders but it is kind of a another one of those shot across the bows a bow so to speak when it comes to markets but you can see we did stall out a little bit and came back in not the end of the world but as I've been saying ad nauseum, I sure wish we'd get above this 4550. That's a big picture news reversal day. They downgraded our debt, which as I've been saying quite a bit, puts us one step closer to a banana republic. Anybody see the drunk history on banana republic? I learned a lot. <laughs> you can learn a lot of history from drunk history. Anyway, and as a composite, a little bit of a rally today, but came back in, closing a plus column, but I wouldn't get too excited just yet. We do have a little Landry light above the 50 simple moving average. And then the bow type moving averages are coming together fairly quickly. But you got to realize when you're at these inflection points, again, one big up day or one big down day can make all the difference in the world. Like the home builders, for instance, I've been pretty bearish on those guys. They had a kind of a sharp rally, even though it was bearish on them. They they just defied my <laughs> my reasoning. But then they stalled out a little bit today, and now they're starting to look bearish once again. So keep in mind that 
it changes quickly. Every now and then, sometimes you have a deep pullback, sets up as kind of like a first thrust or a micro first thrust, and then it begins to rally a little bit, and then it, you kind of go back to, to deep pullback. So when you're playing those inflection points, the market sometimes can, can flip from one side to another. I'm not being schizophrenic. I'm just looking at what happens, and if it rolls back over, then it becomes then it becomes bearish. Keep in mind, if you are taking a micro first thrust or some sort of pioneer setup like that, you are being a bit of a pioneer, and you're either going to get the arrows or the gold. And I hate to to talk too much about the short side, although all I'm seeing is shorts right now. The Short side is a little bit tougher to make money on, a lot of bit tougher to make money on than the long side. There's an old Wall Street adage, all shorts go against you. We put on our first short in quite some quite a while, a few days ago, KBH, a home builder. And it's set up again, by the way, if you were looking to short it, put your uh put all your kids' college funds into it on the short side. I'm joking. I'm saying that because I am short personally. But it, it has gone against us so far, and it's uh, it's always scary on the short side. Anyway, Rusty is just all over the place, stuck in the stupid sideways range, getting thwarted at the 50. I hate to waste any more time than I have been wasting on that stupid index as it just chops and chops and chops and chops. Energies looking a little better a couple of days ago, and even yesterday were all time they were at all time highs. Today coming back in a little bit. Not a huge amount of steam in this last little rally to new highs. I'd like to see some acceleration higher and then some pullbacks, but we might start seeing some long side setups there. George was saying, when will we see long setups? Well, maybe in the energies, okay? Maybe fairly soon. We'll have to see. The foods, not that I can imagine myself rushing out to trade a bunch of foods, but I did notice tonight that they are kind of breaking down a little bit and down toward their prior lows. So that's Kind of interesting. Drugs are a bit of a bummer. As we'd say quite a bit, we had this really one solid breakout day, but it's kind of one and done. And one thing I was thinking about recently, because I tell people all the time, it's like, okay, well, your trend is just one big up day and not a whole lot else. And, and the reason I don't like those type of pullbacks or whatever the case is, is because it's kind of a one and done type of move. Everybody has to rush in and buy and makes this nice wide range bar higher, which is bullish, by the way. But then it's like, it becomes like, a eh, now what? Okay, a bit of a shoulder shrug. And it just, uh, the excitement just kind of rushes out. It's kind of like uh, GBTC, you know, you had this huge excitement, but there was no follow through buying. So that obviously is a major bummer. Now, manufacturing, and, and this is coming back to the inflection point type of thing. About a week ago, manufacturing looked like it was rolling over. A couple of days ago, it looks like it was trying to break out the new highs, and then now we're kind of stalling at the old highs in here. So that's a little bit of a concern. And the recent peak in here and these recent all-time highs isn't too far away from these previous all-time highs. So that's a little bit of a concern to, as usual, follow through is key. Stop if you heard that before. So here's the home builders. One thing to notice here is the angle of inflection of the bow tie into the 50 simple moving average. That's kind of a cool thing, the way that sets up. I know, again, you want to party with me. Drink beers and talk about moving averages, right? <laughs> but you can see it's starting to look questionable. Once again, we rallied up. We didn't get past the 50. So we'll have to see what happens here. But I am short KBH. And tonight, a plethora of home builders and home builder adjacent uh, stocks showed up in tonight's Landry list, my watch list for tomorrow. John says he's down. All right, we're going to talk about moving averages and drink beer. That sounds like fun. I used to brew my own beer, but um, I gave up, I took up half the garage. I gave that up when I moved, when we downsized significantly. But you'd be surprised how many friends you have, especially especially rich friends. I guess rich people don't like paying for stuff <laughs> when you brew beer. But uh, we'll have to go out and get some. There's a, well, it used to be a brewery. It's, it's uh, they just have local beers now, uh, within walking distance from here, so I can meet you out. That was one of my low-level bucket list items: be within walking distance of a bar before I die, which is kind of silly. Leisure looks like it's in trouble. You can see bow tie moving averages again into the 50. 
So that's kind of an ugly looking chart. Not that it's a big deal in and of itself, but when you start kind of putting the case together and looking at more and more sectors that are in trouble, home builders. Home builders, I think, is a little bit more significant because that's kind of an ugly thing. You know, that's kind of a, maybe an economy driver type of deal, and that might be reflecting the higher interest rates or whatever. Economy slowing. I mean, that's that's a little scary, but I guess leisure. Some could argue that leisure might reflect that too, because the first thing to go is fun. <laughs> I was, I uh, probably should tell it. I was dating someone once when I was first thinking about going full time with this venture. And she was looking over my shoulder and she was looking at the budget I was making. <laughs> first and last time I ever made a budget. And uh, she she was like, where's entertainment? <laughs> and I'm like, there will be no entertainment until I get my, <laughs> until I get off the ground with all this. And uh, she broke up with me shortly thereafter. But, you know, that's good. <laughs> it would have been a nightmare anyway. Anyway, before I digress too far and say stupid stuff, transports keep bumping up against these old highs, keep getting thwarted. So that's not a good thing. You can see we bow tied to the downside, well below that 50 simple moving average. Lots of support down here, but it still would be fairly ugly if we went down there to test that support. Software, one of the better looking areas, although I don't want to jinx it. It could end up at an inflection point. If it begins to sell off a little bit, then it's going to start looking like a bit of a head and shoulders. So now our work is cut out for us. We really have to pay attention. When the market's just going straight up, no big deal. Market's going straight down. Well, you know what it's doing. But when you get these inflection points in these sectors and you start seeing a lot of individual stocks within the sectors, again, like the home builders begin to roll over, that's when you need to start getting a little bit concerned. So I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we'll see some follow through and the semis uh if you guys want me to look at any individual stocks go ahead and uh punch them in now i'll take a look at them as we're almost done with this semiconductors kind of a bigger picture head and shoulders in the works we did get back above these bow tie moving averages we are back above the 50. my concern here is we're going to have a little resistance here and then that's also that also corresponds to this prior top so we could have a head and shoulders top inside of a double top. Let's not worry about that just yet, but like the like the warning shot, we probably need to at least think about that a little bit or at least have it in the back of our minds. Bonds did find support at their old lows. My concern was that we'd go down and test them. We did. We bounced off of them, so so far good, so far so good. If you're looking for a little bit of a silver lining, but longer term, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see that the trend so far, at least, remains down in bonds. All right, George wants to look at HNRG, HNRG, HNRG as a TKO. Okay, it's sort of thin, but not too thin. It's a little wide and loose. I think I would pass because it's a little wide and loose. I mean, good eye as far as, as seeing this right here and identifying that TKO, that looks pretty good. When you back the chart out a little bit, you can see, well, we really didn't get past this prior peak in here very much, right? And we almost TKO'd right back into the base and it is a little wide and loose. I know it's an energy stock, but I would hold off on that for now. I think, if the energies can hang in there and maybe accelerate higher a little bit and then do the knockout, I think TKOs, good point, George, are going to be the pattern there for energies. All right, any more? Got me one to beer now. I try not to drink during the week. <laughs> That's another reason. You know, we down. I would still, I'd still have it when the downsides, but it, it was kind of hard to not drink and walk by that tap and say hello, hello. <laughs> All right, any more? Going once, going twice. Well, while we're in pass, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. It looks like we broke another record, so I'm pretty happy with that. You want to attend live, DaveLearner.com slash webinar. If you like this video, please like it. Okay, it helps the algorithm. And if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. I guess I'll take a, a not like. That's fine. They don't even show them anymore. That's a bummer. <laughs> you know, uh, that's another story altogether. And uh, subscribe too, please subscribe because that that helps uh, that helps me provide more free content on YouTube. Everybody have a great Labor Day weekend. I know I'll see you guys and girls tomorrow, and I will be hanging out probably at least a few times over the weekend. So if you need to catch me there, 
or I will be on Facebook. Everybody, again, great holiday weekend. Have a great holiday weekend, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.